Hello and welcome. So in this lecture, I want to talk about lighting in Unity. So I went ahead and made a new 3D project and I just imported some of these models. So we got a bed here. We got some drawers and a shelf. And also I added a plane for the ground and that's about it. You will get these models in the course description. You can download them. And I want to talk about lighting. So you can see every time you create a new scene by default you will have a main camera which just renders the game and you will then have a directional light now you can see this is our directional light let me just select it this here circle and you can see if i drag it up here it has some kind of these rays firing off basically how a directional light works is no matter where i place it in the in the scene it's going to cast shadows in this direction so you can see that each of these objects are indeed drawing these shadows in this direction if i now press e and rotate this light you can see how these light spheres are now facing a different direction the shadows are also being drawn in a different position so it doesn't really matter where you place the directional light what matters is the direction in uh, edit that it's facing so if I set it to this, the shadows will be drawn in that direction. I, I can basically choose whichever direction I want. Okay, once we're satisfied with our light, we can go ahead and in the inspector tab, we can go ahead and see the light component. Now, the type of this light is directional. We have a few different types of lighting. We have a spotlight, a directional, a point light, and a area light, baked only. We will talk about these in a few moments, but for now let's continue with the directional light. Each light has a color, the color that is lighting up the scene. Let me just show you if I disable the directional light, how the scene looks dull, there are no shadows and there is no color. So let's, let's go ahead and re-enable it and now we have shadows and color. So now I can click on the color here and I can change these values and you can see that we now have a different color light in our scene. This is really useful, for example, if you want to make the player feel cold, you would choose a kind of bluish light. If you want to, to make the scene feel hot, you would choose a reddish or yellow light. I'm just going to reset this one to zero, to, to white. Feels nice. And then we have the mode here. Now this light is set to real time. We also have baked and mixed. Basically, the light is going to be processed in real time. If you're building the building an app or a game for mobile, you would choose baked. And basically, now you see how we lost the lighting from our scene. That means that we would have to go to our lighting window and bake the lighting to so it can be ready for users. But in real time, this means that as the app runs, the light will be building and calculating itself. Then we have the intensity, basically the intensity of the light. And if I drag it up, you can see basically what that means. I'm just going to reset it to one. And we also have the indirect multiplier, which isn't too important. And now we have the shadow types. We have soft, hard, and no shadows. If I set no shadows, of course, there are no shadows in this light won't cast any shadows kind of self-explanatory but we can set them to hard shadows and basically these shadows will try to be as precise as possible and they will use up a lot of processing power and then we have soft shadows which are kind of blurry and aren't going to be as precise i believe the soft shadows are good enough and then for our shadows we have some parameters here we have strength they're all really self-explanatory. You can play around and check to see what you like best for your game. And also we have a cookie for the chat for the light, which can be a texture, but I won't you can see how the scene changes. I won't be using anything, any cookies for lighting in this lecture or in my games, but it's good to know about them. So let's go ahead and see what kind of different lightings we have. So let's change the type to spot. And now we, we can see we have the spotlight and we lost all light from our scene because 
the direction light was lighting up our scene in the direction. And now we have the spotlight and this area here. So let's go ahead and actually rotate the spotlight and I can reposition it. And you can see this small little faintly, the white sphere there, that's the point light actually lighting up that place. We can increase this range and you can see how now we have a small white light there above the bed. We can also increase the intensity of this light and now we have a greater spotlight and this bed feels like a chosen bed, kind of like the light is shining down on it. And again, of course, you have the same parameters for every light. We have the shadows, we can have no shadows, but I prefer to use soft shadows. And then we have the mode, the color. Let's set the color to be bluish so it feels cold. And now our bed looks really nice. But of course, we don't have to, we can have multiple lights in our scene. So I'm going to go ahead and click on create, go to light, and I will choose a spotlight, a actually point light now, since we do have a spotlight. And we can see this is a light that is going that is shining in a sphere. Let me just position it here next to our bed. And so it's it has a range in which it emits light, basically. We can increase the range or we can increase the intensity. Basically, you would use this light for, for example, torches in games, for lamps, for... Okay, so for lamps, for torches, for whatever you can think of where you can use a spotlight. Actually a point light, this is a point light. And then finally we have the area light, which is basically we define a area with a width and a height. So let's say 50-50. And now in this area, things would be lighted up. But let's actually, but this is baked only as you've seen. So how to bake light is we go to the window and we go to lighting. Let's go to the settings here and we can scroll down. We can disable auto generate and then click on generate lighting. And of course we need to save the scene. I'm just going to name it main. And it's going to generate the lighting for us. And there we go. The lighting was generated. This is really helpful when, for example, building for mobile apps also uh, when you have baked lighting that means that the lighting was already pre-calculated so the shadows will stay the same so you can't really have baked lighting if you're going to have moving objects but for a scene as this one baked lighting is pretty it, it, it's okay to use baked lighting because none of these objects will be moving around so you can bake the lighting once and never Think about it again. Let's actually make this spotlight a directional light and let's delete the point light. I'm just going to set the intensity to 1 and then let's change the direction to just rotate it like that. There we go. Set it to bake. Go ahead, go to our lighting settings and generate the lighting. You can see down here it's building the light. And there we go, the lighting for this scene has been built. I'm missing my shadows for some reason. That's weird. That's really weird. Hmm. There we go. Okay. So that's been it for this lecture about lighting. Next up, I want to talk about post processing. So until then, goodbye. Hello and welcome. So in this lecture, I want to talk about how you can make your scenes in Unity look good. If you've been interested in game development and have been around the internet for a while, you have definitely come across the discussion 
of Unity versus Unreal. People tend to say that Unreal Engine has better graphics. They say that games made in Unreal look better, whereas games in Unity don't look as good as games in Unreal Engine. Now, this is partially true, because if you took some kind of realistic assets, for example, you have made a house, some something that looks really pretty, and then imported that asset into Unity, and imported, the, imported that asset into Unreal as well, it would look better in the Unreal Engine, out of the box. That is because the camera in the Unreal Engine, by default, has post-processing effects added onto it. So, it instantly has a lot of color, color, color correction, shaders, and all those things like pre-installed into the camera, so the scene looks good by default. Whereas in Unity you can look at our camera and we only have the camera component and a few of these GUI layer and the flare layer. So we don't have any post-processing components added to our camera. And that is the really the reason why Unreal Engine looks better quote unquote than Unity is because it has post-processing effects added onto the camera by default. We can add these effects in Unity very easily. And I just wanted to tell you that is the reason why people think that Unreal Engine looks better. They're not just not educated enough to know that you can make games that look even better or as good as games in Unreal in Unity. It just depends on your knowledge of how to use the actual engine. So let's go ahead and navigate to the asset store. And in here we will we are going to write in post processing. And now scroll down and you will see that there is a free asset called Post Processing Stack and it's a Unity Essentials and it's been developed by Unity Technologies. This asset will be part of the engine in the future but currently it isn't so we gotta download it. I have already downloaded it so I'm just going to click import. You will need to download this assets, asset unless you already have it and now that we have download it and we're ready to import it you will get this window just be sure to have selected all of this so this post processing folder we get a lot of these scripts and shaders go ahead and just click import and it's going to import the package into our project And now with this, we'll be able to add a ton of different effects effects to our camera to make our scene look really pretty or different depending on what style of game you're looking for. So now you can see that we have the post processing folder imported. And I'm just going to select my main camera and add a component. And the component that I want to add is the post processing behavior. Just type in post in here and you will get the post processing behavior just selected. And this script takes in a profile, which is a post processing profile. Currently it's a none, so it requires a profile to work. So let's go ahead and in our assets folder, just right click and go to create. And in here you have the post processing profile. Note that you will not have this unless you have imported the asset. So select this and I will call it PPP as in post processing profile. You can call it whatever you wish. And I'm just going to select the main camera and then drop the profile onto the camera. Now that I have selected the, 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 I will go back to the profile and then here you will see that we have a ton of these different options that when we play around with, we will going, we're going to be changing the look of our scene. So first off is anti-aliasing. If we enable it, we can see that instantly our scene looks a bit different. So if you're not familiar, anti-aliasing is a method of removing jag line, jagged lines so they look a bit more smooth. So basically, you can see when, when I disable it, you can see how this bed here has kind of these lines that look like stairs. And if I enable it, they're kind of smoothed out a bit. That is basically what anti-aliasing is. And here, under anti-aliasing, we have a method. Currently, the method is FXAA, which stands for Fast Approximate Anti-Aliasing. It's basically what it says. It's a fast method of anti-aliasing. 
and I found that it, it works really well. And here we have the preset that it's the default. We can go for extreme performance, we can go for performance, or we can go for extreme quality. Note that all of these different, for example, the extreme performance is going to have anti-aliasing and try to get as much performance as possible, whereas extreme quality will go for, try to get the, the better quality at the cost of performance. I found that setting it at default is good enough. And also the temporal anti-aliasing is really taxing for the machine and most of the time you really don't need it. I found that fast approximate anti-aliasing will be good enough in most cases. Following anti-aliasing we have ambient occlusion and ambient occlusion is basically a method of adding shadows where two or more objects are intersecting. So basically it's trying to keep light from places that it cannot leave. You can see if I disable ambient occlusion and then re-enable re it, you can see that we get a few shadows here and then I can bump up the intensity and you can see how where these objects are intersecting they're getting shad sh more shades. We can also increase the ra radius of these shadows. And you can already tell that you can have really cool effects in your game by just playing around with these values. I'll just decrease the radius here. And then we have the sample count. We can have a low sample count of shadows. We can have lowest low, medium, or high. These options are really self-explanatory, you just have to find what works best for you. Then we have downsampling, which will try to downsample all of these shadows. And then we have a few options here which really are taxing on the machine. I haven't found them to be too useful, so I'm, I avoid using them. Afterwards we have screen space reflection. This is basically a method of reflecting other objects of a surface. Currently if I enable it nothing will happen. Well for it to have effect let's go ahead and create a material. Material. And I will call this material. Let's just bump up the metallic and maybe the smoothness and just drop it onto the onto our ground. Let me just go to my scene view and drop this material on here. Okay. And now if I go to my profile Let me just um, look at my material. Mm. Hmm. Interesting. Let me change the shader here to maybe hmm. really interesting. Let me just go back to my scene, select the ground, the plane here. Okay. The shader is everything is as it should be. Hmm, this is really weird. Reflections are enabled. And then why, are we, why aren't we getting any reflections? And this effect only works with the deferred rendering path. So let's go ahead and select the main camera, go to camera, and you see we have the rendering path is use graphic settings and let's just set it to deferred. And now we can see that we do in fact have reflections. And I'm going to navigate back to my PPP. And if I, I can change the blend type to be physically based or additive, basically what suits you the best. And then we have the quality of the reflections. I'm going to set this to low because, well, to be honest, games don't really need to have super high quality reflections. 
Then we have the max distance for the, sh the sh um, reflections. You can see the drawer over here. When this is at 0 .0, 0 0.1, it's really faint. But if I increase it, you can see how there's more of the drawer. We also have duration count, which is just a new value for max, max ray casting. Let's set it around 50. Then we also have the step size for the reflections. I find find two to be really nice. You can see how the drawer is reflecting really nicely. Then also we have the width modifier, the blur of the reflection. Reflection. You can really get awesome effects with these these parameters. We have the reflection multiplier. You can see how things are looking really interesting now. We have the distance where at which the reflection fades. And we also have, of course, intensity, personal fade, and personal fade. What is this? You can see what it says. Okay, and finally there is a reflect back face. This you don't need if you're going to have reflections on the ground. But if you're going to have reflections vertically, for example on the wall, then you would enable this. But currently for my scene I don't need it so I I won't be enabling it. This lecture is getting pretty long so we'll continue in the next one and we'll then talk about depth of field, motion blur and onwards. So thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next lecture. Goodbye. Hello and welcome. So moving onwards we have depth of field and this is basically what it says depth of field. Basically as in with cameras we can have objects in the front be focused and objects in the distance be blurred with this. Currently in this scene you can see if I bump down the aperture here these are terms from photography so if you're into photography you will have an easier time to understand this. Basically if we increase aperture you can see how the blur the focus is different and then we can play around with this to get what we like. Really with this scene you can't notice the depth of field. Okay now, then we have the focal length which you can see the effect of on the screen and the kernel size which I will keep at small just so that we have better performance for our games but I don't really need the depth of field so I'll just disable it then we have motion blur motion blur is very important it's you have definitely seen it in video games mainly action games and first person shooters it basically well blurs motion when objects are moving too fast for the camera to pick up their movement it, the camera will kind of smooth out their movements, create a blur, stretch out the image so that it's it it's easier to look at. To demonstrate this effect, I'm going to create a import a import a package, and I'm going to import a go to characters and import this package. I'm going, this package will give us the first person character, that's what I want. I don't want the rollerball, so I will disable that. I don't want the, the third person character. I don't want the cross platform import. Actually, let's sure we can take off the others. But under characters, just make sure to select the first person character and import that. In a later lecture, we will be creating our own first person character. In this one I'm just going to import the Unity pre-made one so I can demonstrate the effects of motion blur. It's not good to use the pre-made first person controller in your own games. We'll talk about this later. But for the sake of demonstrating it, the motion blur I'm just going to use it here. Let me just, okay this has a collider. Okay let me go to my characters, first person character go to prefabs and drag the FPS controller into my scene. Let me just move him up. Let's see if he's above the ground. Okay, he is. So let me play the game. 
and you can see how I'm moving that we have a faint motion blur but actually let me just disable maximize on play here play now okay and I'm just going to now navigate to my profile and we can increase the shutter angle and the sample count so you can see the difference in motion blur this might be hard for you to see because I'm, because I'm recording this but you will definitely see this on your own in your own project and we can also increase the frame blending to give us kind of a drunken effect and you can now see if I disable motion blur that the effects are instantly noticeable let me now jump out of play mode and clear this I will not be using motion blur in the Continuing this, let me just remove the FPS controller from this scene. I don't really need it. And also, you couldn't really see the effects because... Let me just undo that. The FPS controller has his own camera. And we need to add the post processing uh, behavior to that camera and then the profile onto that. Sorry, that was my mistake. Let me just go back and en enable motion blur. You can see now if I move around and move the camera how these objects are blurry let me just now decrease the frame blending now we have a better a much better camera a slight motion blur you, you can see how this is very good at for action games these objects don't have colliders so we can just pass through them don't worry about that also, this first-person controller has camera movement up and down and it has sound and I really don't like how this is set up and later we will set up our own first-person controller, you will understand how they work and it's much better to develop your own. And for now I'm just going to jump out of play mode and disable motion blur. Then we have eye adaption. This is basically when you example when you go out in real life when you just wake up and you look at the sun you kind of squint your eyes because the sun hurts your eyes but then after a few moments you get used to the sun so you can look at it and that's basically what this is and all these these parameters here are just how much you can adapt to the light I really don't tend to use this at all so I'm going to disable it and then we have bloom and these are just some of the effects to make they really depend on the type of game you're developing they can make your game really stand out so for example bloom if you have kind of like torches or any kind of glowing objects it will make those objects stand out much more currently we don't have any glowing objects in this scene so you can't really notice much a, a difference but if I increase the radius here you can see how the background the sky here is blooming because it is well the only thing in the scene that can be affected by this I'm just going to disable it then we have color grading this is pretty good for making some colors stand out and here we have parameters such as black in you can have the color black how much it stands out you can decrease that then we have white blackout white out these parameters are really made for you so you can play around with them see what suits you the best and w when you see it you can just decide how how you want your game to look and feel we also have temperature the more we increase it this the scene will look hotter the more we decrease it the scene will look colder we have the tint hue shift you can see how when i'm changing the values of this the hues of the game objects are changing so you you know the default bed has a blue blanket but as i'm changing the hue here it's go it changes all sorts of colors zero is the default 
And then also we have the saturation. You can have a black and white game by setting the saturation to, to zero, or you can have a really colorful game by setting it to two. The colors will stand out. Then we have the contrast. You can see if you set it to zero, your game really stands out. There's nothing to be seen at all. I just keep this at one. And then here we have the channels, the channel mixer for the RGB colors. You can increase the red color of the scene. You can decrease. This is really awesome to play around with. I don't want to take away your time by explaining. It's really self-explanatory. You just have to enter this and play in. This is like a playground for designers. We also have the trackballs here for the three. For slope, power and offset, we can, you see, I can just drag this around and I get different colors in my scene. I can also right click into one and just restart its colors. You can see now I got a really interesting scene going on with the colors here. You can also change the... You can add keys here and just change the curves. You see. You really have a ton of options when it, when it comes to this. Unity doesn't limit you. You see now I have a really interesting scene maybe for a psychedelic experience game. Let's just continue. So then we have the user LUT. LUT stands for lookup texture and if we enable it we would need to import a texture here and then we would change the contribution of that texture to the scene. Basically the texture would have the light maps of the scene in drawn onto it. So you could open Photoshop and just, just create a texture then drop it onto the LUT parameter here and then play around with the contribution and you could see the difference in your scene. But I'm going to disable this since I don't have a lookup texture. Then we have the chromatic aberration. Then we, we also need a spectral texture here. Then we can increase the in intensity and you can see how the objects are kind of like moving towards the camera as I increase the intensity. If I had a texture they would behave differently but I don't. You can of course experiment with that as well. Then we have the grain This is really a nice effect if you're looking for th a type of game kind of like in a TV, in those old Kato TVs where you have the grain on the on the screen. You can also increase the size of them. They can be black or white or, or they can be colored. We can play the game and you can see how the grain is actually moving. It's not stationary so it feels kind of like I'm in a television this is really starting to look weird, like a psychedelic trip. I don't know, maybe you could make a game about how it is to be on LSD. I personally don't know, but it could be something like this. Then we have Vignette. I'm just going to uh, disable grain so you could see the effects of Vignette. We can enable it, and then we have Mode here. It can be Classic or Masked. Let's just go ahead and explore the Classic Mode. Currently the color is black. And here we have the center of the vignette, the intensity, I can increase it. And you can see we, we are getting some kind of eye hole kind of effect on the camera. We can also get the smoothness here. You can see as I increase it, we get more of these lines here. And then we have also the roundness. So I can set the roundness to zero and increase the intensity. And I got this, this black box. It kind of feels like in like I'm in a movie now, or like I'm the television. Like I'm the television. I'm looking through a television and walking through a house, which is really interesting. It can be rounded or it can. We can round it or not. Then we have the masked mode, which you would put in a texture, basically any type of texture you want. It can be a texture of Batman, and then you would have. The vignette would look like Batman, you would see through the face of Batman. Then I'm going to disable this, and finally we have different dithering, which is just, we just enable it. It doesn't have any parameters. 
nothing to configure. Hmm. Well, I guess this just fixed the differing, that just enables differing of ca the camera. Okay, so that's it for the lectures on post processing. I really encourage you to play around with these settings and just go nuts. Try out everything, every combination, and get ex get inspired to create a game with really weird effects. So thank you for watching. I'll see you in the next lecture. Hello and welcome back. So in this lecture I want to go ahead and create our own first person controller. Last time we imported a FPS controller that is provided by Unity. But I don't really like this FPS controller and I don't think you should be using this in your video games. There are many different reasons for why this isn't good enough. First off, you can see the head bobbing and people really don't like the head bob. Then there is the really awful walking noise. And the character just walks really weirdly. When I stop pressing W, he will still w continue walking. The jump is also really weird. But those aren't really all the problems that we have with this. Now, this FPS controller, if we select it, we can see it's a parent. It also has a child, which is a first-person character. But if I go back to the FPS controller parent, we can see that it's, it has a transform. Okay, we're familiar with that. Then it has a character controller. We haven't really encountered any of these yet. And then it has this first-person controller script, which is really huge. It has a ton of parameters is walking, walk speed, run speed, run step, length, jump speed, stick to ground force, gravity multiplier, mouse look, use FOE kick, FOE kick, use head bob, head bob, what? I mean, you can't really... You don't know how this is set up. You don't understand how the person who coded this thought or how... It's just really big and it's really hard to build upon on this it's also right from the get-go not good enough so why would you be using this why not just create one from scratch and you'll see that our script will be much simpler and it will work much better than how this is set up and then we have a rigid body which is cool we know what that's what this is we have an audio source yeah okay and then the child is a transform it has a transform and it has a camera and basically the default things that a camera has. Okay, so from the way this is set up, we can learn that the camera is a child of the player, so when the player moves, the camera will move with him, which is kind of like basically how every first-person game is set up. So let's go ahead and delete this FPS controller. I will also delete the assets that I've imported because I don't need them. And I will go ahead and create a new script called FPS character. And let's just open it up now. I'm just going to reload it. And now back into Unity. Let's actually create our player. So in our scene view, I'm going to go ahead and go to create 3D object and sphere. Whoops, I want a capsule, not a sphere. I mean, you could use a sphere, but a capsule is usually what's used in these first-person games. Basically, if a first-person game doesn't have a first-person character, it's going to be a capsule. That is the big secret of game development. Now you know it. Every first-person character that doesn't have a model is just a floating capsule. So let's, let's now decide which height our capsule will be. I think this is good enough. And now I will select it and call this capsule player. I will also add a component. I will add a rigid body because we will of course need a rigid body. So it interacts with the gravity of the world. And now I will get our main camera, which is facing in this direction. It's looking at something. And I will just drag it onto the player so it becomes whoops, so it becomes a child of that player. Now that the main camera is a child of the player, we can reset its transform and it's going to be centered in the player. And now I can just drag it up onto his head. So that's this is kind of his eyes. 
And now if I rotate the player, you can see the camera also rotates. And if I select it, you can see it's looking at the bed and the little drawer there. And also I'm going to select our player and make sure to disable the mesh renderer because we don't really need that. Our player is going to be an invisible capsule like all, well, most FPS characters. Just an invisible capsule and a camera walking through the world. Okay, now that we have this set up, let's go ahead and select the player and just drop our FPS character onto his inspector. And now open our FPS character. And of course, like always, we will need some kind of speed variable. So let's go ahead and say public load speed. This is going to be the movement speed of our player. Now we could go ahead and like we did with the previous 2D games, check each button, pr button press. So if input get key down, W move them up, but there's a really a much easier way to do that, which I'm going to show you now. If we go to edit, and we go to project settings and we go to input we're going to see the input manager and here we have the axis and now we have the size of the axis which is 18 if i write in 19 we're going to get another one down here but it's going to copy the last one so we're going to have two cancels and then i will would be able to change the values of this axis but let's not talk about this now what i want to show you is horizontal and vertical now the name of this axis is horizontal and the negative button is left, the positive button is right, the alternative negative button is A and the alternative positive button is D. It can also be used with a joystick. So basically if I am pressing A, that means that on the horizontal axis I am in the negative. So it's a negative 1 on the horizontal axis. If I am pressing D, however, it's a positive 1 on the horizontal axis. But if I'm not pressing A or D, it's a zero on the horizontal axis. The same goes for the vertical axis. The positive, the negative button is S and the positive button is W. So if I'm pressing S, that means I am negative one on the vertical axis. If I am pressing W, I am positive one on the vertical axis. And we can use this in our script to use it to easily move around. So I'm going to create a float here, call it uh, Z let's call it um, Z movement and let's create a float called X movement and here in our update method we're just going to set Z movement to be equal to uh, get axis input dot get axis and the axis that we're getting is so for the Z movement it's going to be vertical and we want to multiply this by speed and time dot delta time. So basically, each frame, if I am pressing W, this is going to be a 1 times speed times time dot delta time. So it's going to be moving me forward. But if I'm pressing S, this is going to be a minus 1 times speed times time dot delta time, which means it's going to be moving me backwards. If I'm not pressing W or S, it's just going to not do anything. Now let's go ahead and for the X movement, do the same input, get axis, horizontal, and also multiply this by speed. And again, time dot delta time. And now we can just say transform dot translate, whoops, translate equals, so on the X, it's X movement, and on the Y, it's zero, and on the Z, it's Z movement. Okay, let's save that and let's go back to our character. Now select our player and let's set the speed to maybe 10. Okay, let's now run the game. And you can see I'm actually moving my player around. And as you can see, there's no head bobbing, there's no sliding around. But you <laughs> you do see our player f fell down. That's because we have the rigid body and we didn't constrain the rotation from our player. Let's go ahead and do that. Sorry, I forgot about that. Let's just freeze the rotation on. Uh, let's actually just freeze them on all of them, all of these axes for now. And you can see I'm walking around the scene real nicely, but we still can't jump and we still can't look around with the mouse. Don't worry. We're going to implement that in the next lecture. But for now, you can see how very easily we made a movement script for our player 
and we know how it works and we can always change it however we like and we will always know what we did with it and how it works. We, we don't have the un Unity's huge movement script that isn't too good to be honest. Well, thank you for watching and we'll continue in the next lecture. Until then, I'll see you. Goodbye. Hello and welcome back. So in this lecture we'll be creating a simple camera, a simple script that will allow us to move around, to move the camera. Currently if I just play the game I can walk around but I can't rotate the camera. So we're going to create a script that will allow us to do that. Let's go ahead and right click and create a C sharp script. I will call this camera movement. And now make sure to add this script onto our camera. Oops, let me just drag it onto our camera. There we go, and let's open it up in Visual Studio. Now, in order to do this, we're going to need a few variables. First up is going to be a public float mouse sensitivity, which is going to be the sensitivity of the mouse, the actual movement. And then we'll go ahead and create a mouse smoothing float. So the camera kind of follows smoothly, follows the mouse smoothly, so we don't have re super fast transitions, which could result in headaches. Headaches. Let's go ahead and now get a public game object player. We're going to get a reference to our player, since we're going to be rotating him as well when we rotate the camera. So we need to reference him. And finally, we'll need a vector to called mouse look. We don't need the start method, let's delete this and let's save the script and head back into Unity. And you can see that it hasn't loaded, so let's just exit from Visual, from Visual Studio and now get back into Unity. You can notice the loading bar here. And here we go, we have the mouse sensitivity and mouse moving. I will set both to 1 now. And let's just get the player, drop it into the player parameter. Now this of course won't work, we need to go back into the script and add a few more lines. So back in update, let's go ahead and create a, a new vector2 called mouse position and this will be equal to the current mouse position. But how can we get the current mouse position? Well if we go to edit and go to our project settings and input, we can see that we actually have a mouse x and a mouse, and mouse y, which are actually the for mouse movement. And that's exactly what we need. So a mouse can only move on the x and on the y axis. So that means that we want a vector 2. So x and y. So let's go ahead and say that this is equal to a new vector 2. The first, the x value of this vector 2 is going to be input dot get axis raw. The difference between get axis and get axis raw is that get axis raw is going to give us a more precise value. Let's call so the string here is going to be mouse x. Make sure you don't make sure to get the exact string so you can see that there's a space here. You can actually just copy this and just paste it in here if you wish. But I just wrote it like that and it will work. And the second one's input dot get axis hello input.getAxis raw and this one is mouse y okay so there we go each frame we're getting the position on the x and on the y axis of the mouse and feeding it into the mouse position vector 2 variable okay but now we want to do another thing with the mouse position variable and that is that we want to scale it a bit on the vector2 so we get better movement. So let's go ahead and say vector2.scale and this takes in two vectors. It will multiply them so we get a better movement. So the first vector is going to be our mouse position vector and the second one is going to actually be a new vector2 and for the x value of this vector2 we'll go ahead and say mouse sensitivity times whoops times mouse smoothing and for the y we will also say mouse sensitivity 
times mouse is moving. Okay, so now our mouse position is smoothly moving and following the cursor. Now we have this mouse look vector 2 and we're going to simply set it to be to each frame be increased by the mouse position. So mouse look plus equal mouse position. And finally we want to rotate our character. Let's go ahead and get the local say transform dot local rotation. Now this is the local rotation of this camera and it is equal to quaternion dot Euler angles actually angle axis sorry and negative mouse look for the angle and the vector 2 is going to be equal to vector 3 actually the vector 3 uh, dot right uh, sorry here we want minus mouse look dot y my mistake apologize and finally we want to rotate our player so let's go ahead and say character actually player in our case transform dot local rotation and it's equal to again quaternion quaternion stands for the third dimensional rotation and we want again angle axis but in his case is going to be mouse look dot x and character character actually player sorry I always get them mixed up sometimes I call him player sometimes character and transform dot up there we go now if we save this and if I head back into unity make sure that the camera has our script attached now if I click play you can see that I am actually moving the camera but I'm moving the, the cursor to the left but the camera is going to the right that's because we said in here minus mouse look minus let's actually we wrote in minus mouse look x so that's why I moved left and it went right to the right that's my a typo now if I run the game you can see I moved the mouse to the right to the right we move the camera to the right move it to the left we move the camera to the left up and down so now we have a really nice controller. We can also increase the sensitivity and the mouse moving here to see how now the mouse is much more sensitive. I'm just moving the cursor slightly and we're getting really big movements here. There we go, really easy way to set up our player character and you understand everything, how it works and it doesn't have a ton of components it just has a speed variable so thank you for watching in the next lecture we're going to talk about occlusion culling which is a really important technique in first person game development sorry about that oops let me just mute my phone so yeah thank you for watching and we'll do that next time but i have a small challenge for you i want you to implement jumping in our FPS character. You should know how to do that by now. I'm going to give you a hint. In our movement script, you can see how we transform the translate on the X and on the Z. We just need to get a method that when we press space changes our movement on the Y. You can add a force to Y or you can just transform translate dot the Y position. I leave that up to you and your imagination. Anyways, thank you for watching. Next time we will talk about occlusion culling. So until then, goodbye. Hello and welcome. Today I want to show you a technique called occlusion culling. It's basically you have definitely experienced it. Basically AAA games such as Fallout, Skyrim, or how, how is the new game called? The one with the dinosaurs. Horizon Zero Dawn, all the new games are using this technique. Basically, how it works is, currently you can see the camera preview, and basically only the things that I see here will be rendered to the game, and the things outside of the camera will not be rendered, so they will be invisible. Currently, 
this isn't set up with, the, with this project so you can see even if I'm only seeing this project in the camera window all of these objects behind me are still existing in this scene so that's not really good if I open up the stats you can see that we have about 4.5 thousand triangles and these objects around around me are really unnecessary since I'm looking at this this drawer here but if I were to turn around the drawer I'm not looking at him it shouldn't be invisible now it shouldn't be rendered and all the objects that are I am looking at should be rendered so that's basically a collision calling and it's really useful and I'm going to show you how to set it up in unity if you're making a first person or third person game definitely include this in your game it's going to help you a lot with performance so select your main camera and if you scroll down you will see occlusion calling make sure that is enabled then make sure that each of your game objects I have grouped, grouped them all in and just made a parent out of them make sure that all of them are static basically this technique only works with static game objects so game objects that will never be moving and then go to our window tab and go down and into occlusion calling and now we have here a new tab that we can dock anywhere but I like to just keep it here because it doesn't have too many information it doesn't take up it doesn't need to take up much space then we have the scene filters I want to select all game objects that are static you can select renderers occlusion area as well I will just select all game objects and then we have here bake options we have smallest ocular smallest toll and then back face threshold usually the default parameters work the best so I'm just going to keep them at default but you can play around for your own sake and let's go ahead and now when this is ready we can go ahead and click bake this is going to bake the occlusion and now you can see that when I'm moving the camera all of these other objects are disappearing and only the ones that I'm seeing are actually rendered so in the camera preview I see the bed and I see this drawer and this drawer and only the, those objects are rendered and now when I'm moving the camera that drawer slowly disappears from the scene and he unloads and then the bed disappears you can see how this really works amazingly when I'm rotating the camera there is really no like I can move it extremely fast they just appear and disappear really fast you can see just this technique is really useful and really simple to set up I, s I don't see a reason why you wouldn't include this in your game basically and this helps you so much with performance and it's just a really awesome technique so there you have it really easy to set up and works really awesomely I can also move the camera as you, as you can see while I'm moving I am not rendering the objects that shouldn't be rendered and I'm rendering the objects that should should be rendered again let's just rotate really quickly to show you how it works in real time and of course this will work on any camera third person or first person just make sure that all of these objects are set to be static if they are not static this technique won't really work now you can see the occlusion calling because I left the tab but when you go back to it you can see how it is working in real time and there you go that is basically it for occlusion calling I hope this was helpful to you and I hope you see the potential of this technique and you realize to use it in your projects so that's going to be it for this lecture thank you for watching and we'll see you in the next one